I'm Eric Topol, and I'm so pleased to have a chance to have a conversation about the pandemic with my colleague, Dennis Burton, both of us being on faculty at Scripps Research. And for all the years I've been at Scripps Research, I've been uh, the go-to person for me has been Dennis. Uh, not only has he been leading uh, the field and working on HIV vaccine, but has an extraordinary uh, background in immunology and vaccinology. So, Dennis, what a privilege to have a chance to have an extended chat with you today. Well, thanks for those kind of words, Eric. Great to be here. There's so many questions about the pandemic and immunology is becoming uh, the hottest field of all because it seems to be what is uh, helping to deconvolute a lot of the mysteries. So before we get into some of the biggest questions in immunology, can you give us your general view of the landscape or where we are right now, now that we've been through several months of this pandemic and it's been hit, the U.S. has been hit quite hard. What, what, where do you think we are at the moment uh, and, and where are we headed? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the great uh, hope here, of course, is a vaccine. And um, I think we've made very good progress. Um, I think that, um, you know, there are several vaccines now that are uh, in the clinic at various stages. Um, I think there's a great deal of optimism that, that, that these, um, a number of these will be um, effective. We don't know for sure how effective um, and we don't know how long, how durable they'll be. But I think there's a, an optimistic view in terms of vaccines. I think the other question will be how quickly they can be made to, um, for a, a, a larger population. So from that point of view, I think things look good. Um, I think that um, from what um, I've seen that uh, the clinical care is now uh, getting better and better. So I think there's more better management of the um, disease. I, I think that uh, antibodies as drugs have now entered the clinic. And um, I think that there's a good hope that they will uh, do some good things. Um, so I think we're in, um, um, you know, a, a reasonably good position. I still think we've got a long, long way to go. And uh, I still think that um, uh, social distancing and masks and, and so on have a huge role to play, that we really do have to um, stick with those uh, kind of behavior um, patterns. But I think that, um, you know, I, I think that the, the, the pandemic is not going to be with us forever. We, we, we can, um, you know, look forward to, um, to days when this is gone, but, but, but we are going to have to do a lot of work in the meantime. Right. All right. Well, the optimism is good. Uh, we, we need that to help us get through this. Now, let me start before we get to the vaccine, which obviously a, a central import. But before we get to that, the immune response to the virus. Now, um, this is highly variable. We have yeah. a large proportion of people that have, never have symptoms or don't have symptoms that they distinguish as being potentially uh, COVID-19. And then we have lethality, uh, at least fortunately in a small percent, but still uh, we've already had likely over 200,000 deaths in the U.S. already. So this is um, seems to be a, a full spectrum, especially emphasized on this asymptomatic or some people call it posse symptomatic because there's very few symptoms. W what is your experience about that with this diverse heterogeneity of response? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think necessarily that's uh, completely unusual. You know, I think there always are uh, large genetic and, and other factors that lead into the um, uh, an immune response. I think here, you know, there are clearly, the immune responses are, you know, there are basically um, uh, three sorts of immune responses. The innate immune response, which varies a lot uh, between different people and which can really, I think, take care of the virus at a very early stage. Um, and, um, you know, obviate too many symptoms. There is the, um, the antibody response, which again can vary uh, a lot between people and clearly does in terms of 
what we measure for uh, antibody responses. And then there's the cellular immune response, which again, you know, can vary. And it's likely that all three of those responses um, contribute as well as other as well as other factors like you know underlying problems and so on so health problems and so on so when you build, bring all of those factors together i think it's not surprising that um, that outcomes do vary um, do vary quite a lot well let's start with of the three parts of the immune response let's start with the innate uh, which is somewhat uh, centered around interferons. And uh, you, you, what's interesting is that we've already seen some, as you say, people, hosts uh, have defective interferon response that genetically, and that may predispose them to getting severe cases. It's obviously a limited number of reports, but that's certainly uh, out there. We also, I guess, have a sense that the virus itself can help take down the interferon response. So it's here it is, the innate first-line defense, and it's already got, we have a virus that can basically um, turn that off. And then we also have this idea of giving people potentially inhalant, but some way, uh, interferon um, early, where there's some promising data. Do you think that is a likely, this, this interferon innate part of the innate immune response, is that something that we should be able to build on in the, in the future to help? We don't have a drug that prevents this. And we know that some people, this is a big deal, but, uh, at least in the limited genomic studies. Does that make sense to you or is that uh, really tricky? It, it, it does, but it, it, you know, interferon is a very powerful um, mediator of, um, of responses, of antiviral responses. And, you know, it, it can... Um, it can, in certain circumstances, um, make things worse. I'm not saying COVID, but it, in, 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 in other circumstances, in other viruses, it, it, it can, um, you know, make things worse. So I think um, uh, tapping into that, one probably needs to do, um, uh, one probably needs to be very careful. One probably needs, um, you know, good animal data in the first place and then, um, you know, cautious uh, human experimentation. Yeah, there are a bunch of randomized trials ongoing. But what's interesting to note, uh, Dennis, is that when the interferon, type 1 interferon was given late, it was harmful so far yeah. in the multicenter study in China. And if it's yeah. given early, it's like the opposite of dexamethasone. Uh, if it, when given early, it seems to have this salutary effect. Now. The second area that you touched on, on the humoral response uh, on antibodies, it turns out um, you've taken antibodies and at Scripps there's been lots of structural biology work from convalescent patients, monoclonal antibodies. They all aren't neutralizing, that is, they all aren't potent, effective antibodies. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, that. That again is true of most viral infections. So the, the antibody system is, is simply set up to recognize uh, proteins that, that, that are coming into the body that are not self. So it, it cannot uh, distinguish a protein that um, if an antibody is made to it, it won't, it won't do anything bad to the virus. You know, the virus is producing a lot of breakdown products, viral debris, we sometimes call it. If you make antibodies to viral debris, that's not going to give you any advantage. You really need to make antibodies to the surface of the virus to stop the virus from gaining entry into uh, target cells and to get rid of uh, the virus. And those are um, neutralizing antibodies. We call neutralizing antibodies because they prevent they neutralize the virus, they stop it get, gaining entry. But those are, are definitely a minority. M most antibodies m that we make most of the time don't do us any good in terms of, of pathogens. But, but you know, that's, that's, um, that's the way the system works. And it's difficult to know how else you could do it. You, you, you simply want to to, to recognize danger and get rid of it. And sometimes the danger's not really 
that, but you know, for a virus, certainly is. Well, well, let's zoom in on the antibodies because first of all, I think it's important for people to realize that the, a lot of the antibodies that are being produced are, are not of any functional value in taking well, down the virus. And so, for example, in the convalescent uh, plasma that's being used. Uh, without a randomized trial, you might not predict. It, it may vary considerably from one uh, donor to another as to whether it has neutralizing capacity, right? It, it certainly does. It certainly does. And I think what you would need to do there is to, and I think what people, the, some attempts to do is to see if you get a better outcome when the antibodies, the, the, the titers or the levels of antibody in the plasma that you give to the infected patients if that uh, correlates. So if you have a higher neutralizing, uh, amounts of neutralizing antibodies given to you when you're infected, do you do better? Um, that's kind of one of the key questions. Unfortunately, I, I don't think the trials to date, even though they've been done in rather large numbers of, of, of folks, are really giving a definitive answer. And um, that's... Um, you know, that's unfortunate. I think we'll probably get an answer quicker from some of the um, new studies with the, the monoclonal antibodies that have been isolated and, and, and mass produced. And, right. Um, now, that's where uh, some a lot of exciting work, much of it or some of it at, at Scripps, um, where, you know, atom by atom, there's been structural biology and cryo-EM and basically mapping these antibodies and the epitopes. And there's lots of different proteins uh, of the virus, uh, the spike protein and the nucleocapsid and the envelope, and you can run it through. But what antibodies work the best? What are the most potent antibodies? Right. So all the antibodies that are neutralizing that we know about uh, bind or, or, or yeah, attach to a single protein, the spike protein. So if you remember the, uh, the pictures that we see almost or more than once nightly on TV, the, the large red uh, protein on the surface, that's the spike protein. And they're, they're kind of like spikes. And that all viruses usually, or many viruses have those spikes. Um, they're different between different viruses. But um, coronavirus, uh, the, the virus that causes COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, um, it has that, those red spike proteins. And it's antibodies to those uh, spikes that, that protect. And antibodies against all the rest of the proteins, um, as far as we can see, they don't do much. And, right. then, and then actually... On that um, spike protein, there are, certain, there are antibodies that, that, that bind, that do very well, that are very potent in protection, and some that are less so. So it seems that the antibodies that um, attach to the spike and um, directly to the site that the spike uses, because this is the purpose of the spike protein, is to, um, the, the spike protein is going to attach itself to a, another protein on the surface of the target cell called the ACE2 receptor. And the, the, um, the, 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 the ACE2 receptor uh, binds to a site here. Now, if the antibodies bind to this site, they're the most potent. So, um, and, and we've seen that, we in several different groups have established that over the last few weeks. And that's that the, the receptor binding domain, RBD? The RBD, the receptor binding domain, uh, contains several sites actually for antibodies, but the ones that bind bang on the ACE2 site, they're the, uh, they're the best. And is there a name for that? Or is that just an epitope? It's, it's just, it's an epitope. Uh, we call it the RBDA epitope to distinguish okay. it from B and C. Okay, um, now, um, you, as you already alluded to, instead of relying on patient convalescent uh, plasma with a mixed variety of antibodies, yeah. some, of, some of which are not really of any value, but the engineering of these monoclonals based on structural biology, based on uh, potent neutralizing um, uh, effect, have led to several programs 
uh, many different companies that are in clinical trial. Now, one of these, uh, interestingly, is distinct from the others. It uses a cocktail approach because it's a worried, that apparently, this is a, the Regeneron uh, biotech yeah. company. They're worried about escape variants. So could yeah. you comment, do we need a cocktail? What are these escape variants? So, so this is hotly debated. So this is hotly debated as to whether we will need a cocktail or not. Um, safer strategy may be to, to, to um, make a cocktail. Uh, the trouble is it, it's more difficult. There are more logistical problems. You've got to, you know, if you're going to make a large quantity of one antibody, it's twice as difficult to make a large quantity of two. Um, but, you know, if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. So what neutralization escape is, is that, you know, remember there's the spike that I, that I, I was showing you. So if you now um, um, have the antibodies coming on here, now if there's some change here, the antibody can no longer bind and then um, it no longer works and it no longer protects you. So your kind of insurance policy against that is to have another antibody that binds somewhere else that won't be affected by the change in the virus. And um, for some viruses that change very rapidly, like HIV and influenza, um, you know, that is, you know, really probably a, an almost a necessary strategy. You, you would really um, uh, not try and deal with those viruses without using multiple antibodies, hitting multiple sites because of escape. But for uh, SARS-CoV-2, it's not clear yet how, how much it's going to change. It's a slow, so, slow, slowly it's evolving a slow, virus, right? Virus, right? It's a, so far slowly evolving, but it might evolve more quickly once we start um, putting pressure on it, we call it. So, you know, once we start presenting it with the problems of people, lots of people with good antibodies, it may have to, uh, you know, change in order to keep going. Uh, you know, selfish DNA, that's what viruses do. They, uh, they find ways of solving the problems presented by the immune system in order for them to survive. Um, and we'll have to see. And so there are, there are some uh, concerns that are going with cocktails. You mentioned Regeneron. There are others who are sticking with one antibody for now and then see what happens. And if you know, there is escape, they'll have backup antibodies. So it's... Yeah, that's it's really helpful. Going. I like the selfish viral virus. That's a very important concept. Now, yes. when we get to uh, the next part of the immune system, the T cells, they have right. been getting lots of play in recent weeks. Right. Uh, our, our friends at the La Jolla uh, Inst Allergy Immunology Institute, uh, Shane Crotty and Shane others, Crotty done and some nice, nice yes, work. They've been doing beautiful work. Yeah, so yeah. there, what's really fascinating is that some people have at least some pre existing SARS CoV 2 specific T cell response that's cross reacting from. The, the four common coronaviruses of common colds, that is. So the point there is that's not the same as uh, getting through an infection from this virus, right? Right. It's, right. It's so the, what, 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 what they have found is that there are, you know, T cells that have been um, generated against the, uh, the common cold coronaviruses that now have the ability to... Um, react against cells infected with, with um, COVID. And um, so in principle, they may be able to uh, protect us. Now, the way T cells work is that the cells have to become infected first. So that's one of the distinctions. Antibodies are, well, the very first thing is innate immunity, but after that, it's antibodies that are circulating. The antibodies are there in the blood. They're proteins. They're in the blood. They're ready to go. You, you know, they'll, they'll, they're ready to go in milliseconds. They're there. And if the virus comes, they can take it out. Bang. Um, 
T cells require that the virus has infected some cells. So they don't act on the virus, they act on infected cells. And so in a way, there's a, there's a delay there and there's a danger because you've got to wait a little while. You've got to wait until the infection has, has, has got going a bit. But nevertheless, that could be a huge advantage to be able to um, suppress uh, infected cells. So ideally, you would just have no symptoms. But um, even if you had some symptoms, if these T cells are around, they may be able to greatly reduce them. And in the case of uh, a, a respiratory virus like this, they could maybe confine the symptoms to those of a cold. So you would have the, you would have the infection in the upper respiratory tract, which, you know, it, it might be unpleasant, but it's not life-threatening, um, and prevent the infection getting down onto your lungs, which would be the, um, the, re the real problem. So, you know, and that's, that's, what we, that's what we always ask of a vaccine, really, is prevent disease. And if, you know, if they prevent serious disease, then that's really very valuable. Well, your distinction is important just to underscore that the antibodies that are potent neutralizing are directly attaching the virus, whereas the cytotoxic T cells that are taking on the virus are really going after the cell with the virus within it. And this is a really important distinction. Now, it turns out recent studies beyond, uh, well, in addition to the one I mentioned, uh, same labs and others have shown that some people, you can't even detect their antibodies, but you can, even asymptomatic infections, detect uh, these T cells, specific right. cells. And in addition, there have been some patients you've probably seen where they're a gamma globulinemic. They, they have no antibodies, but yet right. they have a, a, a very good way to fight the infection with their T cell response. So right. we're, we're learning that there's this variable response where some people are relying more on T cells how do they how do they do that without obviously the with people who are born without antibody potential but how how is that happening that some people just don't ever go through the humoral response or to any significant degree well i mean if they're a gamma globulinemic then um you know they don't make any antibodies usually these days and for a long time they will get Im immunoglobulins given to them they will get uh, so um, that particular uh, cohort of people no longer exists with no antibodies at all because you are susceptible to certain viruses and, and uh, you, you really don't want to have no antibodies. However, it is true that, um, that um, you know, simply with um, T cells, you can provide a fair degree of um, protection. And I think probably what, 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 what a lot of people think is that um, the best situation for a vaccine is when you combine um, a good antibody response with a good T cell response. That gives you the, the greatest possibility for controlling the infection. And so, and probably a, a number of viruses do that. We tend to focus on neutralizing antibodies because they are like the, um, they're the, the, the first line in many ways, but, but we're, we're probably also in many vaccines inducing the T cell response as well. Well, and that's, well yeah, and the point uh, you're as also getting at is the antibodies are relatively simple and common to measure, whereas the T cell response requiring cytometry and research labs is certainly not a clinical lab uh, domain. So. That's a big part, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's definitely a part. And it's also much more difficult to show that T cells, are, you know, that you might be able to show that you have certain sorts of T cells, but do those T cells actually um, kill infected cells? And that, you know, that puts another layer of complexity on it. And it's, it's you know, it, it's still complicated. It, it, it's a fact that... Um, you know, with vaccines that are that work really, really well, we still don't understand all the details of how they work, and uh, which is sort of remarkable considering that, 
you know, vaccines are probably uh, done more to promote human health from a from a medical intervention standpoint than than, than virtually anything else. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating, actually, when you think about that. Now, that's really that's a good segue into the vaccine uh, world, which we have only barely touched so far, but. The vaccines, uh, there have been several programs now that are actually already into phase three of almost or approximately 200 that are out there in some sort of development. Those vaccines have reported in phase two studies and in non-human primates. And there's quite a variable response. Uh, A couple of them are uh, mRNA vaccines. A couple of them are, you know, different sorts. But some have very, they all have a a nice neutralizing antibody response, but the T cell response in terms of the CD4, the CD8 response is highly variable. What do we make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think certain um, vaccine modalities are definitely designed to be more antibody oriented and others, um, you know, there are vaccines that have been tried, for example, in HIV that are wholly T-cell oriented. Um, they've not succeeded. Um, and then there are vaccines that um, will, will probably combine antibody and, and T-cell responses better. And it all depends on, 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 on how the vaccine is uh, formulated in essence. Um, and some of the newer vaccine strategies, the ones that have been very quick, the mRNA from Moderna, which has gone in. Um, I think that's probably, um, you know, more uh, antibody oriented. There are other vaccines that um, uh, that use so-called uh, viral vectors that um, use a, a, an innocuous virus, if you like, to bring in the, um, the, uh, the, the, the proteins from the virus. They are, um, probably going to do better in terms of um, antibody T cell balance. But, you know, we don't know, and this is a point worth emphasizing a million times, is that with a new virus, a new pathogen, there's so much we don't know um, that we can't know at this point in time what is going to be the best um, protective mechanisms against, uh, against this virus. So, you know, having, having a, a, a series of different viruses, uh, sorry, of different vaccines with different strengths and weaknesses is probably a very good idea. Yeah, no, for sure. It worked out well for that score. But can we, t- can we learn anything from the original SARS, that's what, 2003 uh, or so, where we had people still today that have an antibody uh, long lasting, and some people have still manifest T cell specific response to SARS, that is SARS CoV 1. This is now many, many years later. Are the structural aspects of these two re- viruses enough to try to extrapolate that people will get long? Uh, and that was, of course, without a vaccine. Long, right. durable I mean, effect. I, I mean, what, it, 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 some extrapolations probably could be made. Um, the number of um, SARS, the, the original SARS um, patients is, is, is not so large and has been, not so many have been followed, I think, to be really definitive about that. And anyway, I think, you know, one doesn't necessarily need to play by the rules of natural infection when, when you're talking about a vaccine. So if you, and, and a dramatic example of that is um, papillomavirus, HPV, where if you look at the natural infection, the uh, responses, the antibody responses are quite low, very low even. But, if, but the vaccine, uh, which is extremely effective and which, you know, protects now, is said to be a cancer vaccine because it prevents papillomavirus and cervical cancer, um, that vaccine is uh, induces much better responses than uh, the natural infection. Mm-hmm. So you know, it, it, what what we can say is that probably natural infection. If you just looked at coronaviruses as a whole, you would say that natural infection induced rather um, 
quite strong neutralizing antibody responses, but they weren't very durable. Uh, they didn't last very long. We don't necessarily need to play by that rule for a vaccine. The way the vaccine is set up could uh, induce, first of all, much higher responses. Secondly, um, they could last much longer. We'll just have to, we'll have to see. Yeah, that's really important. The idea that you could get a vaccine that works better than how humans uh, would respond on their own is, is a critical point. Now, the other issues about vaccine is the worry factor. Not so much that we'll have vaccines that are safe, but they'll have these untoward responses of antibody um, uh, enhancement uh, and things like you know immune complex disease and serum sickness. Can you are you worried about that? Um, not, not particularly, not, not, not to say that one shouldn't, uh, you know, do appropriate trials and, um, and eliminate those possibilities. One, one should, you don't want to jump to, you know, vaccinating 10 million people, um, immediately. You, you, you do want to, uh, do, do things in, in stages. Um, the, there, there are two types of, uh, enhancement as it's called antibody mediated enhancement one type is associated with uh, antibodies binding to particular cells and then um, getting into those um, where the antibody binds to the virus and actually helps the virus get into a certain cells and that type of effect has really only been described for um certain viruses of which dengue virus is an example they're called flavy viruses dengue yellow fever um, zika um, uh, west nile those are, are viruses of, of, of that uh, type and um, there there really does seem to be the possibility of antibodies under certain circumstances making things worse um, but those can be avoided if, if, if the conditions are set up correctly. That's one kind of um, concern. For, um, for COVID, there's no indication at the moment that that mechanism works in vivo. There's no clear indication, but you know, folks look at lots of different studies and they do experiments and, and you know, you'll get a little bit of an indication here that maybe this could be something um, and, and so, you know, some level of caution is, is reasonable, but, but overwhelmingly, I would say um, the evidence does not suggest that this will be a problem so far. But keep remembering this is a new pathogen and we don't know everything. We really don't. So that's one mechanism. The second mechanism is what you mentioned, um, particularly, which, which has been seen um, in the 1950s, um, uh, 60s, which was that um, if you induce, with your vaccine, induce too many of the wrong type of antibody, then you can get what's called, as you said, immune complexes formed between the virus and the virus proteins and the antibody, and they can get deposited in bad places like in um, tiny vessels in the lungs, and that can lead to uh, damage to the lungs. Um, now, again, um, a good vaccine won't do that. And um, we are aware of that problem. And I think that it's, it's highly unlikely that that will turn out to be a problem with the current vaccines. So, you know, some caution, you know, some humility before the fact that this is a new pathogen and, you know, and we can do all the studies we like in test tubes and in uh, model systems, but we do need to see what happens in people and um, monitor them carefully and, 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 and move in stages and, and go forward. Now, let's say we've got one of these vaccines. It's passed its phase three. It's, it's now approved for use next year sometime, perhaps. Are we going to vaccinate everyone or are we only are only if you've not had a prior infection that is if you've already been through this and you have antibodies would you still have a vaccine 
Um, I think we'd have to know what level, we'd have to know more. We'd have to know, you know, what level of antibodies uh, provide protection. Um, and, um, you know, if, if those folks are immune now to the virus who've already had the virus and how long they are immune for. Um, so I, the, 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 there are questions that would have to be answered before you could say whether people infected, previously infected, need to be vaccinated. Yeah, I mean, overall, it's estimated that at least 13% of Americans have now been through an infection, whether they know it or not. So it's not a trivial percent as you start to give them a vaccine that could, if you gave someone who has had an infection, a vaccine, would that potentially be more of a risk for that individual? I don't think so. I think you would again have to, you know, you'd have to look at the immune parameters and, uh, and, 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 and take things cautiously. But, uh, but I, I, I think that that would be. Uh, and, and, and what about if somebody, when the neutralizing antibodies come out and they get those, and they last for some several weeks or maybe months, would that be an issue about giving those people a vaccine? It, 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 might, um, it might for the time that the, that the antibodies were circulating. So you would have to vaccinate them once the antibody levels had uh, dropped. But, it wouldn't, but they would be protected by the passive antibodies for the first phase, and then you would vaccinate them, and then they would be protected by the vaccine. So there wouldn't, but but it would be a consideration. Yeah. yeah. yeah so you know, Dennis, nobody's been talking about this stuff yet. Uh, this, as far as I know, I try to follow the literature pretty uh, closely. I haven't seen people talking about if you've had an infection and you needed the vaccine, if you had the neutralizing antibodies, and when you're going to get the vaccine. These are practical, important issues that haven't even been confronted. Yeah, important issues that, you know, and, and, and probably a lot of them need more data in order to, you know, make informed decisions. Now, you've been working on the HIV vaccine uh, for some time, and you probably, well, you know more about vaccines than anyone I know. And people say, well, you, you're optimistic, as, as most people in the in the vaccine expert world are that there's going to be a successful multiple vaccines likely but can you also help pe people understand why this is a different challenge than hiv right yeah i mean um this this virus in many ways is quite straightforward it in, in fact it um you know you get good neutralizing antibodies from infection and if you immunize animals, as far as we've seen, and now people, you can see that you get pretty good neutralizing antibodies. They may be concerned about how long they last, but usually we can deal with that. Or, 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 or there are, I mean, worse comes to worse, you're vaccinated every year, but um, you know, there are ways to deal with it. Um, for HIV, the great problems are that, uh, first of all, the virus is highly variable. So, um, you know, what do you vaccinate against? There are hundreds of thousands of different strains out there. There are hundreds of thousands of different strains in a single person, never mind out in the wide world. So you have to um, find those few parts of the virus that are its weaknesses, its sites of vulnerability, if you like, on that envelope, on that spike structure. You have to find the few places that antibody can get in. And um, that's uh, challenging. Now that particular problem has been solved over the last few years. So we have found the weaknesses uh, of the virus, um, but now those weaknesses are, 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 we have to be able to take advantage of them. And that requires very precise uh, immunity or vaccine design, candidate, vaccine candidate design. And it really, you know, if you, your normal situation is if this is your spike, your antibody can come in like this or this or this, and all of these may well work. But with HIV, you've got a very narrow mark. You've got to come in just like that because all of this other areas are blocked. And that is, um, so that means you've got to design something so that the antibody system just responds to that and that's hard 
And that's meant that uh, we've had to learn a lot about, um, about uh, design of proteins, about persuading the immune system to behave in the way that we want it to. And, um, but we've made a lot of progress. And, um, you know, a, um, an HIV vaccine based in this kind of a, a rational, precise approach, it's coming. But it, 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 it's hard and it's, you know, it, it, it's, in a, it's on a longer time frame. I know you like big challenges, so it's just right for you. Now, uh, Dennis, the structural biology has really come into its own uh, in, in terms of the pandemic. And obviously, as you alluded to, for understanding HIV, that 3D uh, cap capability, you want to comment that, you know, years ago when people were making vaccines, they didn't have any structural crystal structure of, uh, of a virus, a pathogen, of the antibody, of anything. So doesn't that really kind of reset our, our capability in many respects? It does. It does. And that was sort of re revealed when I said rational vaccine design. It's not that originally vaccine design was irrational. It, it wasn't. It, but it was much more empirical. So, um, and, and, what, and what you dealt with were, were um, pathogens for which um, uh, the, the, the pathogens really hadn't evolved lots of fancy mechanisms to avoid antibodies. They didn't need to. So, you know, you take measles, you know, measles will jump from one person to the next. Boom, 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 boom. And it, it, it doesn't care about the antibody response you make to it because it's already moved on to the next person. It doesn't care. HIV, it's got to sit around maybe for years and years before it can jump to the next person. It's got to coexist with your antibody system. So it has to find all sorts of ways to avoid being uh, neutralized by antibodies. So it's evolved all sorts of mechanisms. The classic one that everybody knows is variability, lots of different strains. But it also has other mechanisms. It, it has this so-called sugar coating. So this spike protein that we talked about has a lot of sugars. That, so, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, um, it, it, it's, it's just a much more difficult problem to deal with the, the pathogens that, that um, you know, have to wait around to jump. Right. right. And, and in fact, as you mentioned, yes, just yesterday, there was a paper, which is one of the first I've seen, where it gave the 3D structure of, of these glycans and, uh, you know, really looking at how they mask the virus, uh, the spike protein and the epitopes. And the interactions here are so darn complex. And I have to say, I didn't appreciate the value of structural biology, nor the velocity of its contributions until 2020. This has been incredible, incredible to watch. Now, I do want to get into one other topic with you because uh, I, I could talk to you all day. This is fascinating. I'm learning so much. But one of the areas that's still totally unknown, and it kind of is reminiscent of something we talked about with a potential vaccine response, that is yeah, you've been hearing this term long COVID and long haulers. And so it turns out a significant fraction of people who get infections, even mild infections, not just the severe yeah. ones, even young people who are perfectly healthy. In fact, typically more in women. But interestingly, they linger these symptoms and these symptoms include not just uh, fatigue, but also joint pains chest pains, lots of different symptoms, often debilitating, difficulty breathing, and they can't even go on. They, they can't even walk a block. And these are people who were, you know, basically, some of them athletes, uh, some of them, you know, incredibly uh, healthy. So what do you think? No one has done any immunologic studies to date, which is amazing that I know of. What, right. what do you think is the explanation for this very um, troubling problem? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, honestly, I don't know. Honestly, I have very little idea whether it's some immunological basis or not. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, obviously, it's, I mean, I guess it's just emerged, you know, in the last two, three months or so, these, these problems, the, the realisation that um, these are longer-term problems. 
Um, but, you know, I mean, I think um, there are now a lot of measurements that people can do on immune responses. Uh, it's much more possible to um, uh, find defects in immune responses and, and see if they, and they may have no bearing whatsoever on, 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 on these long uh, COVID symptoms. But, you know, it, th they certainly could be investigated by quite sophisticated tools now. Yeah, we really, we, we need to see those studies. What's interesting um, is that whether in some respects this could be autoimmune or some respects it could be that the virus, some of these people are still PCR positive for months. Uh, and whether that means that there's some virus particles that they're reacting to, not the virus per se. Uh, there hasn't been a documented reinfection uh, but there is certainly people that have viral load that of, of particles of, of some nucleotides for some period of time, or as you could call it, debris, whatever. Could that be, could you be having a chronic reaction to particles of virus? Um, that's a good question. Um, I suppose technically it's possible. I mean, I suppose technically it's possible. Um, I mean, I think what you're referring to, I, I, as you say, I don't think it's clear whether those are infectious virus or it's, um, you know, defective particles that are still causing some sort of inflammation. I, I'm sure there must be folks working on these problems already, yeah. presumably, but I, I haven't. Yeah, I talked to Akiko Isakawa at Yale, and she's yeah. starting to work on it. it. Of course, as you said uh, and emphasized, everything's so new. And um, we're just starting to learn. But I think over the months ahead, we'll see these types of immunologic immune response studies to help sort it out. But it's a very troubling thing that, you know, when this started in early in the year, we didn't know that there still would be people here many months out that are really in tough shape, you know. Yeah. Um, now, uh, the virus uh, story, uh, just to close up with, uh, if I can sum up, um, you're pretty upbeat about things. Um, and you also gave caveats, many caveats. The, la the fact that we, the many things we don't know, we need to be humble. Humility is a, is a key thing and open to all sorts of unexpected things that might uh, crop up. But, uh, but uh, the fact that this is a relatively straightforward virus to develop a vaccine and we have smarter tools than we had before and um, these are very encouraging. So I am actually feeling much better talking to you today. I hope our listeners will as well. And I also just want to say, you know, how proud I am to get to work with you and the team here at Scripps who are just doing a bang up job. Everything has been so um, COVID centric in, in this year to just scale up everything we can do to help. And I'm so proud of the team here and to be on a faculty with people like you and our colleagues. I'm just thrilled about that. Oh, same here. I mean, all the work that we do, you know, um, on, on HIV is a, is, a, is, a, is a huge team effort. You know, we have the structural people, Ian Wilson, Andrew Ward. We have um, immunogen designers, um, Bill Sheaf, Rich Wyatt. You know, we have, um, it, it's such a team effort. And, um, you know, virtually the whole HIV team um, switched from um, uh, HIV to COVID. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, the, you can see the, the value of all that effort on HIV over the last 20 years has really um, been hugely valuable in order to move quickly on COVID. And that's not just at Scripps. I mean, it's, Scripps has been very strong, I think. But other institutions as well, you can see the, the efforts that have gone into HIV have made the response to this new virus uh, much more rapid and, and, and much more um, uh, deep and, and, and meaningful, I think. Mm. No, that's terrific. Well, Dennis, thanks so much for no, sharing. You. you know, I, I know I've pumped you with for information very hard, but I really appreciate it. All right, all right. Very, thank, very, you. Very thank, thank you. Thank you.